Join us for a journey as we go back to the great civilizations of the past. Who were the people? What were they like? How did they begin and how did they end? Let's find out on episode 62, King Midas. Previously on Fan of History, we began the Sargon the Second Saga, telling the epic tale about how Sargon the Second tries to reclaim the empire he has rightfully stolen from the true heir of Tiglath Pileser the Third. Well, Dan, what are we going to find out this week? We're going to find out a lot about King Midas, but first I wanted to talk about the Patreon. This is a crowdfunded podcast, so we are reliant on your donations. If you like the podcast, go to patreon.com slash fan of history. And I would also like to thank some patrons. All right. So uh, when you uh, sign up, for the Patreon, you get to choose if you want the reward or not, and the lowest reward is to get a thank you on the podcast. So thank you to Patricia, to Frody, to Rebecca, to David, to John, to Kim, to The Endless Knot, great podcast, and right. to Avery61. Thanks, Avery. Uh, we have some goals we try to reach. We have reached the $30 goal for uh, going past 71 BC. And yes. now the next goal is to go to past 601 BC. That's a bit in the future. And to go weekly with the podcast. But to do that, we need to hit $200. Yeah, that would be, that'd be great. It is a bigger commitment. But I think you'll find it's worth it because we will have the time necessary to put forth the effort it takes to produce this for you every week. Yes, I would have to read more history. And I would get some money for it. That's my <laughs> dream. Make it yes. happen. Yes. You're doing it, Dan. You're doing it. <laughs> okay, so the king of this week is King Midas, of course. But first we need to talk about Sargon II. Quick reminder. We saw him seize power in 722 BC. His name means Saruukin, the true king. Which, of course, means he isn't true at all, but a usurper, as we have discussed. He's the first of the four great Sargonite kings. And they are named after him, then, this, this dynasty. Um, there were initial setbacks in his uh, reign. Uh, everybody rebelled, apparently, <laughs> in the east, <laughs> west. Uh, yeah, in the south. To the north, they didn't have much, but they also didn't like him. So, every direction. And there were setbacks in the south. There was a battle that the Elamites won on behalf of Babylon. Uh, Babylonia is in the hands of Merodach Baladan, the Chaldean, which we'll talk a lot about uh, later. Uh, th there's a new capital being constructed, Dar Sharokin. It's not done yet. We'll actually talk about the official sort of building starts year very soon. When you talk about Sargon, you have to mention Sennacherib. It's his son, it's his chosen heir, it's the crown prince of Assyria. And he has more power than any crown prince before him. And the reason for that is that Sargon really wants to be out on campaign all the time. Um, Sargon doesn't want to be in the capital, he doesn't want to do administration and boring stuff. So Sennacherib has to do it all. So while dad is away fighting, Sennacherib stays at home. He's building new capital, he is administra administrating the whole country, he is keeping the nobles in check. And I think it works perfectly for both of them. But now then, I have to talk about King Midas. How much do you know about King Midas, Brown? <sighs> uh, let me rephrase that. Right. How, what is your, your first thought when I mention King Midas? Right, my, my first thought of King Midas is always going to be the king that is cursed and turns everything into gold. You know, and then he turns his daughter into gold accidentally. He's basically forced to live with this curse. But as far as what the real King Midas was, I don't really have much to go on other than the uh, f fantastical tales. My, my first impression of King Midas was uh, 
an episode of Donald Duck when uh-huh. uh, Uncle Scrooge was uh, cursed with the Midas curse. So he could t- t- touch things and turn them into gold. <laughs> right. Um, oh, that's funny. So there are a lot of myths about King Midas, and there seems to be several King Midas as well, but I'll try to break it down here. Uh, this guy that we're going to talk about appears in two sources that are quite disjunct from each other under two different names, but it seems to be the same person. The Assyrians will talk about him as Mita, king of the Mushki. And the Mushki are kind of a very small mountain tribe. It, it, not very small, but it's an insignificant mountain tribe pretty far away from Assyria to the north. So it's like beyond Urartu. Uh, the Greeks talk about King Midas, the son of Gordias, from this time. And he is located like to the extreme far east from the Greeks. That is pretty much the same spot where the Assyrians put, put him. Okay. And he is then the king of Phrygia, says the Greeks. So if you, if you try to look at the Mushki and Phrygia, they are two very different organizations. Phrygia is a kingdom. Uh, the Phrygians migrated from the Balk- Balkans uh, a couple of hundred years before this. But now they suddenly have a working kingdom that is pretty powerful with the capital at Gordium, which is sort of west of Urartu, north of Anatolia, uh, northwest of Assyria. Uh, And there are like no mention of this kingdom before this. No real mention. You get like these lines of kings and stuff, but it really seems to come into power under this guy. Uh, If you look at the Greek sources then, they have three different kings of Phrygia named Midas. And uh, the first one is from the Trojan War, pretty much. So, 500 years before this. Um, And you have to wonder why Phrygia becomes so prominent here in the 710s BC. The Assyrians have never mentioned this. (laughs) They, They barely mentioned the Mushki. And the Mushki are pretty much a barbarian tribe. Uh, so how can this ki- guy be king of both the Mushki and right. the Phrygians? And uh, people that are more clever than me have tried to <laughs> <laughs> have tried to figure this out. So what they what they thought about? We I use Cambridge Ancient History as my main source for this research, and their suggestion is that the Mushki allied with the Phrygians and that they have a very strong alliance. So the Assyrians think that Midas is king of the Mushki, but it's really an alliance and he is king of uh, Phrygia. Uh, We have some archaeology confirming that the the city of Gordium becomes uh, really rich during the 710s BC. And we have more from the archaeology at Gordium that we will get back to later in in later episodes but so we have this rich king with a rich capital um, the greek sources of course are really bad for this age uh, the greeks don't we know they have regained writing but they don't write down history uh, but what they say about midas is they say a bit more than the assyrians do they say that Midas married a Greek princess, Domodice, the daughter of Agamemnon of Saimi Aulia. That's not Agamemnon from the Trojan War, but another right. Agamemnon. Uh, that Midas traded extensively with the Greeks. I think there is a story that Midas goes to the Oracle of Delphi as well. Uh, the Assyrians will soon be a better source for Midas, but as usual, the Assyrians just describe everybody as evil and (laughs) tell us what happened. The Greek seems to be a bit more nuanced here. Uh, The campaigns of Tiglath Pelleser III has put the Assyrian frontier in the Taurus range in Anatolia. 
And this is in dangerous proximity to the domain of Midas. So Assyria is, there are other places between Assyria and Phrygia, but they are small mountain states. So now the two countries are close to each other. And this is what bothers me with Phrygia, that it just appears here in the mountains and it's much, much stronger than the small kingdoms we're used to of Anatolia and Syria. And Midas knows this. He knows that Assyria is a threat. He knows about Assyria and he decides that the best way to protect himself from Assyria is to influence Assyrian vassals to rebel and sort of build a, a wall of buffer kingdoms between himself and Assyria. So all the small mountain states in the borderland, they get these messengers from the Phrygians telling them that, Ooh, why are you obeying the Assyrians? We can help you. Here is some gold to get you some troops. <laughs> so you're saying that they were trying to influence other countries to do their dirty work? Yes. All do you right. know anyone else who used to do this? <laughs> Uh, don't answer that. Oh, let's, like, let's continue. Oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> so uh, our story begins in 718 BC when Tabal rebels. And Tabal is one of these mountain kingdoms. It's right to the north of Syria in Anatolia. And during the eponymy year of Saru Ibni, the governor of Rasapa, Sargon has to campaign against Tabal. And... Uh, there are some pretty strong thoughts that Midas is behind this. He has uh, gotten some influence with Kyaki, one of the kings of Tabal, because Tabal has more than one king. There's also a possibility that Urartu is in on this. Urartu doesn't like Assyria. Urartu is not hostile to Phrygia. It's like, oh, one more powerful mountain kingdom that can sort of keep the Assyrians away. But before we cover the detail, we cover the details. We have to look at the confusing political and geographic scene of the northwest for the Assyrians. The frontier is fairly flexible. We've seen it moving in the times of Shalmaneser III and in the times of Tiglath-Pileser III. But Sargon will try to solidify the border here. He will try to establish a border and control it. And Midas will then try to make the border be as close to Assyria as possible. Uh, some important players in the region is the kingdom of Q. Uh, it's ruled by both a local prince and an Assyrian governor. I think this was a construction of Tiglath-Pileser III. Uh, there is Melid, there is Atuna, and there is Tabal. And they are still ruled by indigenous kings who hold allegiance to Assyria. They are Assyrian vassals, they have to pay tribute, but they rule themselves. And these four states, Q, Melid, Atuna, and Tabal, they form a diagonal line between Phrygia and Assyria. From Melid at the upper Euphrates in the mountains to Q on the Cilician coast. So, do you get a picture of what the situation is like? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Sargon considered this so important, and he singles out King Ambaris, King Ambaris of Tabal, another king of Tabal, to marry his daughter. So he sends his daughter, Nabuli. This is another indication that Sargon is middle-aged, at least at this point. Right. Because we don't know the age of Assyrian kings. But at some point before 714 BC, there is a marriage, there is a wedding between Ambaris of Tabal and Nabule, the daughter of Sargon. And uh, given the habits of Assyrian kings, but Sargon wasn't meant to be a king, but I think he has plenty of daughters and sons. <laughs> but this one is the important one, Nabule and Ambaris of Tabal, remember them. Okay. So in 718 BC, King Kiaki of Tabal rebels against Sargon. And Sargon strikes immediately. He's sick of all these revolts. <laughs> he will he will he will act. And uh, it's an instant win for Sargon. I bet this wasn't what Kyoki planned. 
So you have right. Midas whispering to him like, "Ah, oh, you can do this. This is great." Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the dude pushing his much smaller friend to take on the bully. Oh no, man! You got, I got your back. I got your back. You can do this. Get him all revved up, only to get his butt kicked so soundly. Yeah, so there are definitely no Phrygian troops involved in this. So um, maybe Midas' promises were empty, or uh, maybe he just didn't have time to react before Sargon won. So Sargon invades the area, takes Keaki's capital, and takes a part of Tabal called Sinitu. This was probably the part that Keaki controlled them, mm. and gives it to King Kurti of Atuna. Who uh, Atuna was one of these other kingdoms. So this part of Tabal gets transferred to Atuna. And King Kurti, he is really happy. He is loyal to Assyria and like, whoa, yeah, I got some land. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Good for him. And that's all that happens in the region in 718 BC. In 1717 BC, it's the official founding year of the new capital, Dar Sharukin, Fort Sargon. During the eponymy of Tab Sar Asur, the Chamberlain, Dur Saruken was founded. But uh, this is not, uh, yeah, sort of, it's in the middle of building and it's definitely not finished. No functions of the Assyrian state moves to Dar Sharukin yet. They are still in Kala, the old capital of Ashunasipal. Uh, meanwhile, King Midas is thinking, hmm. This didn't go very well. <laughs> I need to influence someone else. And he chooses Karkemish. This is much closer to Assyria. Somehow, Karkemish is still around and is a powerful city. They still kind of keep a pretense that the Hittite Empire is still around. They are new Hittites. They have been doing this. The New Hittite Empire went away for 500 years ago. But they are still keeping it up. They are still doing their thing. A tribute to Assyria at just the right times. So remember, they avoided to get crushed by Ashur Nasipal II. They avoided Shalmaneser III. And they inspired in his palace. The inspiration, he got it in Karkemish because it is so beautiful and has these new Hittite things. Uh, he says that we're the of the Hittite Empire. Uh, King Pisiri. So, Karkemish is ruled by King Pisiri. And we've heard about this guy before because he paid tribute to Tiglath Pelesa III in 738 BC. And um, Karkemish has not been very loyal to the Assyrians. They've just been loyal enough to not get wiped out. But now they raise the flag of rebellion against Sargon II. They didn't learn anything from what happened in 718 <laughs> BC. And this is much closer to Assyria, so of course Sargon shows up outside Karkemish. And they're like, uh, where are the Phrygians? King Midas, where are you? Uh, what's happening? Oh no. And it's just another day at the job for uh, Sargon. So he storms the walls of Karkemish. He takes Pisiri and his family. They are carried off to Assyria. And what happens when you're carried off to Assyria, Brennan? You are sent to another place and told to defend it. Uh, that, that's when you're a people. But if you are a person and his family... Oh. You are never heard from again. Yep. You're disappeared. <laughs> yes. So we don't know what happens to these people, but uh, maybe we'll get some hints uh, during later reigns. Uh, citizens of Karkemish, they are transported elsewhere in the empire to ah. defend the borders. Gotcha. There is an Assyrian governor installed in Karkemish. Assyrians are settled in the area, which wouldn't be hard as we are close to Assyria. And so ends the great house of Astiruva that ruled Karkemish from 848 BC. So 130 years of rulers ended by, by King Midas, pretty much. 
But Midas is not done. He he will not stop working on the border until uh, I don't know what he thinks will happen, but at least the Assyrians are not attacking him. Well, yeah, he's like <laughs> he's diverting attention is what he's doing. <laughs> and now he starts working on King Ambaris, the king of Tabal that married Sargon's daughter. Um and Sargon has been behind Ambaris. When Ambaris' father died in 721, Sargon sort of put his word in for Ambaris. Maybe there were several sons that could have taken the throne, but Sargon has been on the side of Ambaris. And now Ambaris has the golden voice of Midas in his ear. And it is possible that Sargon's daughter reports this to Sargon. That, uh oh, there'll uh -oh. be trouble here. Huh. But nothing happens yet. In 716 BC, Sargon builds a fortress at Nakal Mushri. And this is not in the northwest, but in the southwest of the empire. It's close to the Egyptian border. This is the point reached by Tiglath Pileser III in his campaigns. It's right at uh, the Brook of Egypt, the entrance to Egypt. And Sargon puts an Assyrian garrison in place there. And weirdly enough, he takes a local Arab sheik loyal to Assyria and puts him in charge as the Assyrian commander for the area. And this makes uh, powerful Arabs pay tribute to Sargon. And uh, we get another mention of Shamshi, the Queen of the Arabs, who is still on Team Sargon here. Uh, there are also some Arabs being transported to Samaria. And this is kind of, the Arabs are friendly to Sargon, and some of them are transported to Samaria. So maybe there were some Arabs that weren't friendly, or maybe they are volunteers. But Samaria recently occupied, so uh, somebody who is loyal needs to be there. Or somebody who is not a Hebrew. Uh, uh. So we have an Assyrian army, a small one, a garrison, but it's at the Egyptian border. So uh, there needs to be some reaction from Egypt. But remember that Egypt is still reeling from the great attack from Pia. So the Nubian invasion has left uh, Egypt kind of <laughs> shook up. And then we have Osorkon IV. Osorkon IV lives in the extreme north of Egypt. And it seems that he's keeping a pretense that he's the pharaoh. <laughs> so when you reach the Egyptian northern border, you get to deal with Osorkon IV saying that he's the pharaoh. And he keeps this up. So he has a meeting with Sargon. So they physically meet Osorkon IV and Sargon II at the Brook of Egypt, which, which is possibly El Arish. And I can I just wonder what Osorkon IV said to Sargon here. Because it seems that he said, well, I am the pharaoh, I control all of Egypt, <laughs> I'm super powerful. Wow, that is playing with fire, I guess. <laughs> He wants to be yeah. a big shot. <laughs> and the only thing I found about this meeting is that uh, Osorkon IV gives Sargon a present. Uh, so Sargon records, you know, the Assyrians love to record what they get as presents. Oh, yes. And Sargon writes down that he got 12 large horses of Egypt without equals in Assyria. So, 12 horses, yay! Yeah, it's almost as good as monkeys. Yeah, so with, with 12 horses, Sargon lets Osokon forth off with a warning. And this is probably to set up trade with Egypt. Remember that the Assyrians are traders. They love trading, almost oh, yeah. as much as fighting. <laughs> so now we have a, a safe trade route into Egypt. And then Osokon IV's fate becomes unclear. So now let's focus on Osokon IV, because in 715 or 713 BC, he dies. He sort of dies by vanishing into obscurity, along 
with the entire 22nd dynasty. Um, these, well, the things I just said is based on the assumption or the sort of <laughs> after giving it good thinking that Osorkon IV is the pharaoh named King Shilkani by the Assyrians and so king of Egypt in the Bible. So if, if that is someone else, then this story breaks down totally. But this is typical of Egyptian history. It's like everything is hard to know what's true and not. But we don't know when Osorkon IV died. We know there is a King Yamani of Ashdod, that's a city in Gaza, who seeks refuge in Egypt in 712 BC. And by then Osorkon is gone. Uh, we know there is a usurper in Tanis later with a wonderful name, Gemenef Konsbach. Can you wow. repeat that? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Gemenef Konsbach. He will claim to be the heir. <laughs> Come again? Oh, yeah. Nope, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> he will claim to be the heir of Osokon IV and continue the 22nd dynasty, but he doesn't. So this is the end of the 22nd dynasty. And I think we started this dynasty in episode 10 of this podcast. Oh my gosh. That was so long ago. Yeah. It started so gloriously with Shoshenk, Shishak of the Bible in 943 BC. That's even earlier. That's like episode... That's before you came in. That's episode yeah. 6 or 5. This dynasty, the 22nd dynasty, has ruled Egypt or parts of Egypt from 943 BC to 713 BC, 230 years. Wow. Uh, they were Libyans. You were saying? Oh, I was just saying, wow. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a long time, even for uh, a dynasty of Egypt. Uh, they ruled from Tanis in the Delta, and as we said back then, Ruling in the delta, very bad for archaeology because the delta is wet and stuff gets destroyed. But now it's all ruled by the Kushites. And soon there will be no more great war chiefs of the Libyans in Egypt. We had 11 pharaohs in this dynasty. We had Shoshenk I, Osorkon I, Shoshenk II, Takelot the first, Osorkon the second, and we talked about all of these. Osorkon the second was the one who had this really rich reign. Shoshenk the third, Shoshenk the fourth, Pami, Shoshenk the fifth, Pedubas the second, and now finally Osorkon the fourth. So with the demise of the 22nd dynasty, the 25th dynasty is the dynasty to care about. The Nubians ruled by Shabaka. Uh, last decade, I told you that Pia died in 722 BC. It's possible that Pia died in 717 BC, which would then be right now in our narrative. Uh, the Nubians had uh, this, um, when you died, your brother inherited your throne. Mm -hmm. And then when he died, your son inherited, so not his son. And Shabaka was Pia's brother. Uh, we know that Pia humiliated the rulers of Egypt. When he went back to Kush, his power, his influence was reduced. He has put, put everybody back in the place they've been. We talked about this during the Nubian invasion. Right. So now Shabaka is the ruler, but he's also far in the south. So the, the rulers of the Delta are starting to get unruly. You would imagine that this, this Assyrian garrison right at their border should unite them. But they just want to be free from the Nubians. Well, they can't, can't see the threat right outside the door. Uh, it's been 900 years since anybody invaded Egypt with any success. The Sea Peoples tried, but they couldn't do it. So uh, you can't really blame the, the kinglets of Egypt for, thing, for not considering 
there's a risk because they know that Egypt is all that matters. Nobody can invade Egypt. Egypt is super strong. Oh, what's that? Iron weapons. Oh, that's, we don't deal with that stuff. <laughs> Stop <laughs> <than> that. <laughs> And that's all I have today. King Midas will be back. All right. Wow. That was quite a bit. So it looks like in our next episode, King Midas will keep making his evil plans to undermine Sargon's power. Meanwhile, there will be unrest in the east while Merodach Baladan, that's a great name, keeps doing a splendid job for being king of Babylonia. Yeah, I will, in a later episode, make the claim that Merodach Baladan is the best king Babylonia ever had during our narrative. Hmm. All right, looking forward to that. That's not S what Sargon says. <laughs> no, I'm certain Sargon has a different opinion. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, well, please go to our YouTube, like and subscribe and share. Tell your friends about us, please. Give us a review on iTunes. And, uh, or what, and you can, we are, we should be available on any, any form of podcast consumption or all the big ones. Yes. If you know of a, an app or a podcast client that we are not on, let me know and I'll get us on there. Yep. Exactly. Facebook.com. Uh, one more thing. I know sure. we have a lot of new Swedish listeners that came in from my other podcasts in Swedish mm -hmm. and, uh, I am checking for Swedish iTunes reviews, whereas Brennan is checking for US iTunes reviews. And I knew that you guys are good at giving iTunes reviews. So please give reviews for Final History as well. Exactly. We love to read them. Facebook.com slash fan of history. And don't forget our Patreon.com slash fan of history. If you want to follow Dan on Twitter, it's at Dan Horning. If you want to follow me, I'm at Cerulean says hi. So for this week, I am Brennan. And I'm Dom. And this has been the Fan of History. Sargon. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash fan of history. Just a dollar an episode would help us out. Thanks, and see you next time.